Okay, here we go, BB Truck. I'm the co-founder and CEO of BB Truck. I'm, my name is Steven. People often see logistics as moving products or commodities from A to B. But in fact, uh, it's a complicated combination of many different logistics services. Uh, when sending products to your overseas customers, uh, first you require uh, your supply chain department or shipping team to call freight for orders uh, to book your air or sea freight and prepare for export, uh, export arrange uh, first mile truckload to the port, and after arriving at the destination country, there will be import process. Another first mile, maybe one to two million mile transition uh, before the last mile reach to the end customer. And all these uh, different miles of um, service are offered by different logistic companies, so which means different ways of communications, uh, ordering system, and billing system, and tracking system. And all this process are just for one single shipment. So image for, uh, imagine for a uh, business supply chain, you have many more of this happening during the day. So it creates heavy workload, and sometimes the shipment can be untraceable. BB Truck is the solution. We started as an online truckload matching service back in 2019. Uh, first, we saw there are uh, waste of capacities on the backhaul trucks. So we help the drivers um, manage their routine schedules. And uh, with our algorithm, we are able to match the nearest uh, backhaul truckload to our business customers. And after working with our uh, key account customers, we realized that we can do a lot more to help them with their supply chain uh, logistic to help them improve their efficiencies. So we have developed a one-stop platform and we integrated and connect with all sorts of different uh, logistic services. So we can identify the optimized shipping solution um, to our customers in terms of cost or efficiencies. And with our integrated logistic solution, we are able to combine middle mile and last mile together to shorten the transition time of warehousing to achieve faster delivery, flexibility, and reduce uh, carbon emissions. Our revenue comes from both our suppliers and customers. Uh, for each order, each shipment that placed by our order, we charge for shipping fees. And we also charge the user fee per orders to our uh, freelance drivers or, or the uh, truck companies. We mainly go after high-tech manufacturer, retail, and international freight forwarders. And we have started seeing our customer encourage their supplier to use our solution um, to digitalize their current uh, logistics service. And also we can connect the upstream and downstream of the supply chain. As of today, we have more than 480 first mile trucks and full coverage of our um, last mile service in Taiwan. We have expanded to the North American market this year. So we are able to provide the end-to-end -end logistic service from Taiwan to the States and Canada. And we are looking exp to expand to uh, Southeast Asia by 2025. 2021 was our first physical year. We have achieved $1 million of revenue. Uh, we are expecting 3.5 after this month and 8 million in 2024. Our team has uh, the great expertise to address the market needs. Myself, I have more than 10 years of uh, logistic, trading and e-commerce experience. Both of my COO and CTO, they have more than 10 years of experience in um, product development, software development, and data science. We're looking for strategic partners, talents, and investors to join us. Together we can build a world-class united logistic platform. We are BB Truck, a one-stop logistic service for every business. Thank you. Thank you, BB Truck. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, I'm glad that you showed your revenue growth, right? I think I think it's great to see that. 
you know, from 1 million to about, you know, 3.5, right, you mentioned, right? So, okay, great, you know, having good growth is great, but I'd like to ask you, you know, just out of curiosity, um, you know, what's the biggest hurdle for you right now? What's stopping you from, you know, going like from 1 to 3.5, now, instead of 8.5 projection, you could go like, you know, 10, 15 million US, right? I mean, what's, what's that your hurdle to growth right now for you? We are a team of 12 people right now, right? So we need to build a, a, build a bigger team, right? Because we couldn't handle more business right now. Because all, all of our customers are trying to uh, ask their suppliers to use our solutions because they want the supply chain to be visible, I, I guess. So they can do uh, uh, production planning and sales planning. Okay, I mean, just take, take away manpower, right? I mean, manpower is like, just like money, right? I mean, like, you know, Volker, you, you do need more money. Obviously, yes, right? I mean, everyone needs more money. You need more manpower to do more things. But you know, in your industry, what's, what's that biggest thing? Is, is it like policies? Is it like, you know, business, trends, anything like that, you know? Or so is something big in shipping, in logistics business? Or, or are there bigger competitors that are stopping you at any place? Well... With our company, the size of our company right now, right? So um, I think the growth of the manpower is the first concern. We haven't at that stage that um, uh, the other competitors will like, you know, forcing down to us, no. So right now it's the money and the manpower. Okay, but who are your major competitors? Like, what? In this industry, it's like a co-competition. Co everybody can work together, and everybody can be, a, be, be our competitors, uh, especially the traditional logistic players. They are still our competitors, but they, are also, they can also help us. We can uh, put our orders to them. They're either friends or enemies. OK, OK. It's not a really nice question, but you mentioned that you are uh, customers asking their customers to become your customer. Why would these people not want to be your customer? Are there any potential reasons why they would not? It's not a nice question, but it's a, it's a fun question. It's been a long day. Why would I want, not want to be your customer? <laughs> this is a very traditional uh, business, right? There are too much under tables going on here. That might be one, one of the, you know, the answer to you. Great answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I guess that's it. Thank you so much, Baby Truck. Thank you very much. Next startup, CreatorDB. Uh, I'm Noah. I'm the co-founder of CreatorDB. And we're here to lead the creator economy's much-needed Moneyball revolution, utilizing large data sets to better inform our influencer or KOL marketing. So a little bit about us. We founded here in Taipei four years ago. And we set out to create software tools and tech-enabled services to support uh, businesses in the KOL space. Uh, a few facts, we've raised zero institutional money to date, bootstrapped the whole way, and posted some profits too. Uh, so there's a whole lot of equity left if anyone's interested in helping us out. Uh, last year we did 2.8 million in revenue, we're on track to do 3.5 this year. Fun fact, we had no churn this year, we're an employer of choice in Taipei, Really interesting, dynamic, young, international work culture. Uh, something really unique here, I believe. Uh, we've had 65 brand customers, past and present, and we've worked with about 2,500 uh, unique creators, many, uh, most of which, I guess, or not most, the majority uh, in Taiwan, uh, but also globally, especially Japan, Korea, United States. So our founding team hails from Microsoft, IBM, and HTC. Uh, and recently we've been building out our data science team uh, headed by an ex GoGo -Go member. These are some of the uh, brands we've been working with uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, many continue to this day. And there's the team. So here is the KOL ecosystem as we see it. And down in the left, we've got our KOLs or our content creators. Uh, up the top, we've got our brands. That might be some of you. And in the middle, we've got the agencies acting as a conduit between the two. So yes, some brands will keep it in-house, but generally there's an agency involved. Around them, there's all these different tools, services, and whatnot. And the problem as we see it is not a lot of people in this ecosystem actually know about what is available elsewhere in the ecosystem. So what we are going to accomplish is the merging of many of these things under our umbrella 
and our platform, our ecosystem, CreatorDB. CreatorDB is our B2B, basically, right? Anything that a brand or an agency would want to use is under CreatorDB. DB, database, is not sexy for the KOLs. So we've also got another brand, Creator Labs, uh, which is tools specifically, we'll see it in a moment, uh, for the KOLs to professionalize themselves and get them ready to better engage with the creator economy. Our main goal is to democratize the creator economy. So another pain point we saw in this area is that SMBs are often just completely priced out. As tools get better, they charge more, uh, and eventually they just leave behind a whole host of uh, customers that are completely unserved. So we'd like to level the playing field a little bit. Uh, here's that same uh, chart uh, visualized on just how we'll cover the ecosystem with our two, uh, two brands. Um, so CreatorDB will include uh, basically all of these things. Creator Labs are starting to build things uh, to help creators better monetize their content. And yeah, what do we have in place already? So I've actually got many parts already, uh, some complete and some underway. And what we're building is big. It's a brick by brick thing, right? So what, let's have a little look. Uh, here's our home platform. So this is where uh, a lot of people start. Uh, you discover KOLs, you run your campaigns here. Uh, we charge a small fee per seat. And in the future, what we hope to do is a scaling uh, uh, revenue model, basically. Um, just a small percent of your campaign funds. And this is how we allow the SMBs to stay in the game um, and still make a decent amount from the big business. We don't want to lose that. Uh, many of our customers, um, you know, they might already have their own solution. That's fine. At our core, we've still got an amazing amount of data and lots of it from social media. So we're happy to sell that to you via our API. Um, you can check that out. Uh, here is a quick look at the Creator Labs tools. So again, I mentioned professionalizing. Uh, the creators can uh, learn, basically, how to turn their, their channel, their content into a career, or at least a job, and uh, make a little bit of money. Basically, we're freemium. Uh, we like to keep things friendly and accessible, especially to the KOLs. Uh, our agency. So this is a pretty big part of the business. Uh, today, we've worked with about, um, well, like I said, 2,500 creators, create about 5,000 pieces of content. Um, so some people or some brands, some companies, some products, they simply just have no idea how to do KOL marketing. Um, so we're happy to just completely handle it for them. Uh, really quick, memberships. This is a, a personalized area for KOLs to engage with their creators, small amount of fee uh, per month directly to them. We take a very small cut. Here's me, Wai Guo Shu Shu. You can uh, give me some money today if you'd like. Also, we have our, uh, some talent on board. So during our time uh, here in Taiwan, we've actually converted some of the islands biggest YouTube creators to our cause of uh, changing the ecosystem. Uh, you might recognize many of these people right here. Uh, no good pitch is complete without a TAM slide. So we've got uh, almost uh, a bit more than half a trillion uh, globally, 30 billion spent on influencers. Um, I won't go into it, but we have a bit of an Asia first strategy. Uh, Asia is where a lot of this growth is happening. And also it's where we see a lot of uh, availability to disrupt essentially. So some of the next steps we have for 2024, <laughs> I won't have time to go into them, uh, I apologize. And lastly, is just our philosophy of data is the new oil. We can refine it in different ways into different products. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Creator DB. A nice presentation, uh, two quick questions. Sure. You um, are mentioning that you have a very high employee retention and uh, happiness, you're yes. a good employer. Uh, most startups in Taiwan, until today, to my surprise, do not offer stock options for their employees. It's usually the investors and the founders, which is not the right approach. But uh, are you doing this different? Do you actually incentivate your employees like a U.S. startup, like an international startup? Or uh, Short answer is yes. Um, we have given small amounts of stock to high performers. Um, not anything too crazy on the cap table, but a recognition that we would like to continue this journey with you as a good employee. Um, but also we have strong performance-based incentives uh, money-wise as well. Awesome. Yeah, so the follow-on question, because your cap table is, is uh, wide available. Pretty <laughs> so clean. It's big. And uh, you are pretty proud, it seems, that you haven't raised that venture capital. Uh, why are you looking for venture capital now and are you able to actually deal with the pressure that comes with investors 
looking at you because it doesn't come for free in that sure. sense. Sure. Um, I actually think several of the judges are in our data room right now doing due diligence, so I'm okay with it. Um, but actually, my co-founder, uh, he comes from a VC background, um, and he lives and breathes uh, this kind of stuff. So I'm actually um, not the dude that usually does this. Uh, I thought I'd jump in for this one. But yeah, we're very, very ready for it, we believe. And we, we see those funds as necessary, push into the market many of the things we have, right? So you saw we've got a lot of things that actually synergize very well with each other. Um, like the data we get from the agency informs the software and NLP models and payment models and so on and so forth. Um, but we do need the funds to put all that out there. I saw John got a question. Yeah, uh, I have two questions. So, so first one is, I guess, I mean, in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of these type of platforms, you know, KOL matching platforms and then campaign management, of course, has been around for a while. So what makes you... I guess really different from all these other platforms and then the second question would be like I, uh, you talk about you know you have a creator db creator labs and then creator agency so just wanted to ask like i mean the agency part is you know super manual it's, it's not really scalable so i guess going forward what what kind of revenue contribution do you see sure. coming from these three different um product lines uh for yeah. for your company all right, how are we different? Uh, our philosophy is we, we, we would love to see most creators actually um, uh, going out on their own, um, not, not tied to another company. So we would like to basically um, almost eventually remove all agencies from the equation, right? So then brands and the creators themselves can capture more of that. Um, you mentioned, oh, sorry, the second part of your question, oh, it was about the revenue. Look, the agency... Uh, we expect that to be a smaller and smaller part of the pie as we go on. In the beginning, I really wanted to get my hands dirty and understand the market. Uh, how best do that? Do it myself. And started um, doing that marketing and building that agency. It just so happened to generate enough money to fund all the engineers and the development of the software. So I couldn't kill it, right? Um, but it is not a focus of ours and it will become less and less relevant over time, apart from generating uh, good data. No, I think it, oh, it's generally the case. Like you start out, you do agency, you do all these work. It, it's easy. It's easier money, right? So it comes in really quick. And then I guess the, the problem is that you get kind of, you know, tied to that. So then that becomes your business later on. And it's hard to switch to, you know, a more scalable business yeah. later. No, I get that. The co-founder, um, largest shareholder, and our CEO, uh, he hates services and loves software. So we are definitely going in the software direction. Um, regardless of what anyone else has to say about it, um, barring a huge investor. Okay, thank you, Noah. This thank is you. Creator DB. Our final team of the day. Welcome, your CFO. Hi, everyone. This is Dean. I'm the founder of your CFO. Let me quickly introduce myself. I was at Deloitte Taiwan for 18 years, and last year I have uh, left the firm as an equity partner. I'm also the Deloitte Taiwan's Startup Service Group leader. With more than 10 years serving with the Star ecosystem, I find that there's a big point, point for the growth stage companies that's difficult to find qualified CFO. And also, for most of the that stage companies, they don't really need a full-time CFO too. And most importantly, for the CEO, it's very, very difficult to just by interview to understand a CFO's capability. So that's why in 2022, we started your CFO. And for your CFO, our core value is trust and integrity. So we only hire the CFO that we have prior working experience with, or the CFOs we have the right interaction with. And so we want to keep that trust and integrity within our firm. And there are three trust circles with, uh, surrounded by trust and integrity. That would be, first is the trust uh, for the internal CFOs. For all of our CFO have to be trust each other. And also we want to have our client our companies to think that we are one of them and trusted us. And finally, we want to earn the public trust for this USFO brand. And what's the difference between us and the full-time CFO? We provide more flexibility to our clients. We are on demand base, so the client can determine how many hours they need from us. And we utilize the power of the team. Instead of like, you only have one individual's capabilities, and we are having a team to solve our client. And because in USFO, each of our members are using a profit share scheme. So 
your CFO now, everyone becoming a profit center. We need to provide our client more valuable service. And there are six aspects your CFO provides. The first one is related to financial and management accounting. So we will go into the, account, uh, the company to help them to look at the accounting books and also help them to come up with the financial projection, financial budgeting, and also set up some of the KPI plans. And we will also help them to look at their cash management, to look at their cash forecast, to make sure that they have enough cash inflow and manage the cash outflow. And for most of the company, they don't, at that stage, they don't need a full set of the internal control system. But we'll still help them to set up the internal control policies to let everyone to be followed. And a lot of our clients are in the fundraising stage right now. So as a CFO, we will start to prepare the DD room for our clients and also looking for investors and prepare for the company valuation and also negotiation for the investment terms. And after getting invest, we will provide regular updates to our investors to let them know the company's status. And final one is we will provide some of the financial guidance or some of the financial forecast to the CEO in order to make some of the corporate strategies. And we also provide some of the exit strategies that will include in IPO and also M&A. We are more focused on the Taiwan and also in the US IPOs. And there are three types of service we have right now. And most of our clients are using our regular CFO service. That's like 72% of our clients. The regular CFO service, that means that we sign with the client on annual contract and we need to go to the client side on a weekly basis and there are minimum hours required by that week. And for our client industry, there are 45% in software and we have 20% of our client is in consumer industry. And look at the founding stage of our clients because we are focused on the uh, growth stage companies. So now 70% of our clients already raised at least Series A. And for all of, uh, all of our clients with the venture backed, the average funding size is 4.2 million. And for all of our clients, the aggregate revenue and the average revenue will amount to 5.7 million USD. Our pricing model is we charge the client on uh, hourly basis, we base on the actual hours, and then we charge for our client. And for that uh, collections, we will collect partially in cash, and we will also collect partially in equity. Uh, for us to collect equity, that will reduce our client's cash burn rate. And for us, we will help the company to have the, uh, their growth. And so we will have some of the upside for the equity we received. And this is our team. Now we have 15 of CFOs in us, and eight of us are full-time in your CFO. And for our future expansion, because now we're collecting equity from our portfolios, from our clients. So hope that one day if we have enough of the clients, we will become in like a star ETF. And we want to do not only for the CFO service. We are thinking about this, a lot of the talent shortage issue right now. So we also want to do for HR, for IT. So one day that we want to do for your CFO to be your talent. And also now, because the professional service uh, is a very, very localized service, and we are also connecting with some of the overseas companies, they also provide the same, same service with us. And then we might share the same brand name with them. So we ask your CFO, we provide most trusted CFO also in service. Thank you. Thank you, your CFO. You're doing a great job. This is his first startup pitch. Yes, in this his is life. my first pitch. Ever. Hello, so um, is this, if this is your first startup pitch, then I'll give you your first startup hard question, <laughs> right? Okay, so you, you probably hate me after this, right? I mean, okay, I, I understand that you've been a partner in um, Del Deloitte or Peter yes, Deloitte. Deloitte for many years, right? I mean, and I, I respect your profession a lot, right? Um, but to me, right, this is just, you know, what, what, what differentiates you from just another Deloitte, right? It, it mm. just seems that you just came up private, from, you know, Deloitte and going to private practice, and you know, honestly speaking, right? Okay, because I've been start founder many times. I would got my equities like hell. You know, I would never give it out to any of my CPAs, my lawyers. You know, I wouldn't trade it for services, right? You know, money could be earned, but equity loss is gone forever. And I mean, I would like someone, you know, holding equities or my, you know, my company's equities, right, to be, you know, giving me proper advice but not like a mercenary in a sense i would rather yeah. pay for it so i'm sorry that you know i popped your cherry 
on stage with the shitty question, but you know, you know, just just humor me. Yeah. No, no, that's a very good question. Um, the equity we, we received, we are actually based on mo the most recent round, and that means that we will not get the lower valuation the founders have. We just based on the most recent round, and then we get that percentage of the shares. So we will not take any advantage for the um, staff founders, and for the percentage we have for the equity will be considerably small because we are using our time to earn money in certain percentage that will turn that into equity. So, I mean, we try to be fair for the for our part and also for the uh, for the corporate founders part. And what's the difference between the professional firm and your CFO is that. Um, I, I am Deloitte for, for a long time, but like, like Deloitte, we cannot take any of the equities. We, we, it's not any of the equity. That means we can only use our time to earn money. There will be no any of the potential upside. But there's a lot of the uh, professional service, like in the US, they will get equities? Oh, okay. So to follow on, Darren, uh, then to me it sounds, to be honest, better to leave Deloitte and start a VC fund if you're after the equity. <laughs> well. That will be our next step. I mean, because now if we have enough of the portfolios in us and we are providing safe service to them, and then we might start it a fund, but that's a later stage. Any other questions? Do you have any criteria to choose your client? No, we have no criteria to choose our client because we want to serve as many of these stops as we could. So then we can be like a star ETF. So. The only criteria we have is like you have to use at least a minimum hours per week and then we will sign a contract with you. So what's the entry barrier? What if someone from KPMG start like uh, my <laughs> CFO? Uh, for for, for like our CFO. Yeah, so that's the first question. The second question is that do you plan to scale? Uh, is it any possible that after you scale up your business that you're going to turn on to be another Deloitte or to be acquired by Deloitte? Well, I hope Deloitte will acquire me someday. But I mean, for us, if we have to scale, we have to use, I say AI, a lot of intelligent talents. So that means the professional service team as us, we need to use the human resource to, to be scaled. And what if others like doing the same stuff? I mean, there's still a lot of the competitors in the professional service team, but as long as we are, branding, uh, we are building our own brand and client trust us, uh, most importantly, CFO trust us and they will join us. That's a short, short answer for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank